Okay, everybody, welcome back to the Pandemic Baseball Book Club. Uh, my name is Andrew Marinus. I'm the author of Singled Out, which is a biography of Glenn Burke, who was the first openly gay Major League Baseball player and the inventor of the high five. And we're joined today uh, by Kostya Kennedy, who has written a fantastic book about uh, a, a more well-known Dodger uh, pioneer, Jackie Robinson, uh, true the four seasons of Jackie Robinson. Kostya, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm very glad to be on with you, Andrew. Thank you for having me here. Well, I just wanted to say before we get into the questions, how much I loved your book. Um, I mean, it was so beautifully written. It was like reading poetry at, at points, you know, and um, uh, just a real pleasure. And so we'll get into uh, so many of the stories that you tell in it. But just wanted to say right off the bat, what an achievement of writing such a beautiful book. Thank you again. I mean, I really, it, it was a, I felt, I felt close to the book and, and cared a lot about it, as, as I'm sure many people do when they write a book, this one especially close to me. So um, I, I'm very appreciative and, and thank you for saying that. Uh, we've got, obviously, this is the Pandemic Baseball Book Club, so we have a lot of baseball junkies <laughs> that watch these videos. I was curious, um, what was your own introduction to baseball? You know, who were you a fan of as a kid and did, did you play baseball or what's your baseball background? So I grew up in Long Island, New York, um, and I love baseball from an early age for a reason not entirely clear. Uh, my father is, is British um, and, and came here only at age 27. And my mother was uh, born in America, but her parents were both, one was from Vienna and one was from Prague. So, uh, so they didn't have any, there was no baseball pedigree uh, in my family. And I just started to love the game and, and, um, we went to, I, I lived in Long Island, which is on the train line to Shea Stadium. So I became a Mets fan. Um, and so I've endured a lot. It's really built my character, I tell you, Andrew. Um, and I did play baseball quite a bit as a kid. Uh, never never played beyond high school ball, except for, of course, locally and stuff, and then softball for many years. But um, I played on the high school team, and, and that was my last organized ball. And, of course, throughout Little League and all of that as a kid. And I just took my family to a Mets game a couple of weeks ago, and uh, my kids are now there. There were Brewers fans So talk about long suffering, you know, yeah. <laughs> but uh, they got a kick out of the whole Timmy Trumpet scene there at City Field. It's pretty exciting, especially. Yeah, it's been, it's been a fun. They're, they're in a little bit of a rough patch now, but it's been an exciting. Year. I, I've also I've raised my daughter to, as Mets fans, although I wouldn't tell child services that. <laughs> That's right. Well, my, my kids are Vandy football fans too. So oh, you know, okay. who knows? Um, and how about writing? Like when did you uh, develop a love for writing? And at what point did you realize you could marry your love for sports and, and writing, uh, put it together? Yeah, it was really, you know, I wrote a little bit in college. I remember I'm just in, in high school, I'd say I wrote a review of an Ozzy Osbourne album for my, uh, <laughs> for my high school paper. Uh, and then I really started getting into it in, in college. Um, I went to SUNY, SUNY Stony Brook, and I wrote for the college paper. Um, and I, I was kind of a general, became managing editor, but I, I focused on sports as well. And that was when I first got a credential to go to a baseball game. Um, uh, I went to Columbia Journalism School. And out of that school, I, I was looking for jobs and I, I, I love sports. Um, and other things too. And I, there was one weekend, it's kind of a big decision. We sometimes, many of us like look back at a big moment in our professional life. And I applied for a job at New York Magazine at Sports Illustrated. And I was offered a position at those places and decided to take Sports Illustrated. And, and it sort of sent me in that path um, and was able to spend a lot of years covering um, sports that, that I loved. And baseball to me is, is, is in a category of its own. I, I do love other sports and pay attention uh, to them, certainly, but, but baseball is the, the game for me. Mm -hmm. uh, and you mentioned at the outset, that this was a project that was really personally meaningful to you. Um, you know, why was that? And, you know, why did you decide to devote yourself to writing a book about Jackie Robinson? Well, two, two sort of long-term things. Uh, one is I mentioned that my, my mother grew up the, son, the daughter of, of immigrants over here. They were Jewish and came over um, in 1938. So they were fleeing a very specific threat. Um, and the fact that Robinson played for the Dodgers uh, meant a lot to the family, even though they weren't baseball fans. 
Um, and so that was my, that, my, that was my mom knew that player and told me that the Dodgers had been in New York and the Mets came to take their place. So that was always there. Um, his, his importance. Um, and, and so th throughout my time at SI, I, I sort of covered gently various milestones on Robinson and things like that. And then I wrote sort of a long feature on Rachel Robinson for the magazine um, about 10 years ago now. And it was through that that it sort of went to the next level. I, I developed a, a professional relationship with Rachel and with their kids, uh, Sharon and David, and did a couple of uh, sort of book events with them. Sharon's also a writer. Um, and and that's when I began to really feel that it was, even though, of course, we know there's been other good books um, and there's been different types of books, cradle to grade um, biographies, which I respect and admire very much. Uh, but that's when I began to feel that there was some more of the story to be told and, and a different way to tell it through the time spent with Rachel and with other people close to the, the circle there. Okay. Um, I want to ask you specifically about the four seasons uh, that are written about in the book, but um, for the, the, you know, the content of those seasons, just curious about the structure of the book, you know, and taking a figure like this and, and telling it in this way, was that a, a device or a method you had seen done in other biographies or a movie or, you know, how did you come up with that idea? So prom, it, this is not a one-to-one -one comparison, but somewhat analogous and definitely a series that had a big impact on me. There's a documentary series by a filmmaker named Michael Apted, a British filmmaker. It's called the Up Series. And it starts at seven up, as he calls it. Oh, yes. It went and they filmed a cohort of seven-year-old kids in England. Um, and you see their lives. And then you, he comes back seven years later, 14 up. And you see them then. 21 up, 28 up, and people have different circumstances in their lives, great success, more difficult times, tragedy, highs, all of that. But you're being told a story through the passage of time. You're not necessarily, it's allowing you to make inferences. It's allowing you to make, bring, bring perspective to it without necessarily filling in all the blanks. And it was something very powerful. I always felt about that approach. Um, and, and, I, and, and that's sort of what landed me in this direction. The seasons, um, as you know, but I'll just say for, for listeners, they're, they're four specific years, three of which are baseball seasons, one of which is not, but they're also metaphorically the spring, summer, autumn, and winter of his public life. And so I, I wanted to look at ways where he was, where he, I felt that he had changed significantly um, and that each year was sort of markedly different in, in, in his story uh, and not sort of have the obligation to fill in the blank. Um, mm -hmm. And part of that is, is because, you know, th there is stuff out there that people might can, can fill in the blank if they're so interested. And it just felt, I felt like I could, you know, dig into the seasons, the specific years a little more intensely, a little more revealingly and sort of show nuance of life instead of feeling, oh my God, but now I need another 10 pages to say what happened here or there. Right. It, was, it was much less of a, a duty uh, in, in that sense. Yeah, I really love that approach. Um, and you come away with it feeling like you know the man probably better than you would in a book that felt the obligation to fill in some blanks, you know. Um, so if we walk through the seasons, let's just go through them uh, one at a time. Tell us about the spring season that you chose and what was significant about that uh, era of Jackie's life. So that, uh, the, yeah, the figure of spring is 1946 uh, when he, it's before, of course, he breaks in in 47. So it's the year before when he's playing in Montreal for the Dodgers top farm team, the Montreal Royals. Um, and that was one, that year came pretty early on. And I wanted to do that. And that partly, again, to go back to my conversation with Rachel, it, she made it clear and talk with her just how crucial that year was to them as a couple, to the whole venture. Um, and I, I, it's certainly been known, but but I felt it had been underreported and could could use a little uh, illumination. And, you know, you see him; he he he's just getting familiar with being Jackie Robinson. He had, of course, been a football star and was certainly a known athlete, but it wasn't like what he was now doing. And that year, in 1946, with the exception of a few weeks when he had um, a black teammate. Uh, he was the only black player in an all-white league, even when he had a teammate. So there were two of them in, in an all-white league. And that's really where he was breaking the color barrier in a sense, being the one uh, exception on the field. 
uh, in, in a very different environment. Um, he also ha- he had not really played that much baseball at that point. He, he'd played only a year at UCLA, 45 games uh, for the Kansas City Monarchs. So he was learning he was learning to be this sort of figure, uh, immediately a, a political a figure of political and social interest, and also just to be a better ball player. He was it, it, it super talented, and was, it was clear pretty early on that he was sort of too good for the league. But he was a young ball player in the sense of he'd throw to the wrong base or he'd make kind of more elementary errors in, in, in the game. He just ha- didn't have that many games under his belt. And circumstances, as we know, there's so many different circumstances in the baseball game, was still often new to him uh, at that time. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned um, Rachel. And I think of if anything really shined through for me in this book uh, that was maybe, I don't know, different than I expected, but just really uh struck me and i came away with feeling like what a strong partnership that they had you know um and how in love they were and uh, how important she was to him throughout uh his career it, you know became even more poignant for me that he's been gone for so much of her life you know can you talk about your relationship with rachel and just what uh what role she did have um in jackie robinson's uh, career. Yeah, I mean, I think it's sort of a common thing that's said, and it's often true when it's said that, you know, that uh, a person gets their partner through the strength of their spouse. And I think that in, in this case, there's no question about it. we would not have had Jackie Robinson if it wasn't for Rachel Robinson being the being the, the figure that she was, the stabilizing force. Robinson was a very emotional guy. He could, he could sort of react uh, often in a good way, and often I would to benefit as an athlete and as a person. But she was very much of a steadying figure, and she was somebody very intelligent. Had a nursing degree, would go on to hold um, uh, administrative positions, teaching positions, lots of different things that she did in her life. Uh, but she sort of knew what time it was mm-hmm. and stepped back and put her effort into doing everything that they could to go on this venture together. I mean, Robinson would would use we instead of I, even when he, he'd be talking about a headache. We have a headache. Well, uh-huh. in this case, actually, you just have the headache, <laughs> not Rachel too, but he still kind of talked that way. Um, so yeah, it would, it would, you know, I think that there was, of course, a lot of love there. Um, and also she was, you know, she didn't, she, she could, would put him in his place, sort of keep him grounded in, in this really important way. So absolutely uh, the, the, the single most important figure, Grant Rickey in another sense, but uh, Rachel certainly in any kind of personal or larger sense of his life. What's it been like for her over these last uh, several decades, you know, sort of living as Jackie Robinson's widow and um, how did you I'm sure there's a lot of people that would like to interview her about her husband. You know, how did you forge that relationship? Well, what's interesting is that the interview that I did with her initially was really on her work. Of course, everything is tethered to what Robinson did. Um, But uh, Jackie died at the age of 53 uh, in 1972. So uh, obviously a very young man. And the year before they had lost Jackie Jr., um, so at, Rachel suddenly, and she'd also lost her mom right around that time. She's suddenly sort of alone. She, she had two other children, she had family, but the principal figures in her life are now not there. And what she did in 1972, 73 is start the Jackie Robinson foundation, um, and really started throughout her, her own head with, with, a, you know, Jackie's lawyer helped her and she had a few other people who helped, um, and built this foundation, which was going to fund education for kids who needed help and not just funding, but also mentorship. And she put her life into it and it's changed, changed so many lives. Um, and, so, and really when I did that story, it was about what she had done to sort of carry on afterwards and how they, they, they'd done it. So, uh, you know, that Sports Illustrated, I reached out. I said, I, amazingly to me, nobody had really done it beyond like the occasional newspaper story. Hey, you know, look at this foundation. And, and so that's what I did. And then it was over time, I guess, you know, we, we, I spent a few separate days with her and doing that story. Um, and, and again, met Sharon and then David, their, their kids. And I guess, you know, we just developed a relationship through that time and there became then another, I did an event um, where I moderated a talk between Sharon Robinson and Branch Rickey III, the grandson of Branch Rickey um, at UT that was in, in Austin. Um, several other events that we, so it just became a cumulative 
time of getting to know one another and talking about stuff. And I think, you know, she became more comfortable with me. Um, she, she's still with us. She's a hundred years old. Um, she'd begun to slow down a little bit in recent years, um, which can happen if you're a hundred. When I first was getting to know her and she was 90 and then in her early nineties, I mean, she seemed 68. Yeah, right, ninety-two. You know, what I mean, and she was coming to the office all the time, and she was the the sharpest kid in the in the line, and and it was it was amazing. So, yeah, I know when you ever see her on TV, you know, so uh, beautiful and regal, and uh, uh, what a figure. Um, okay, so continuing on with the theme of the book, the summer of Jackie Robinson's career. So you know, the prime of his career with the Dodgers. Uh, did you debate different years to include, and how did you settle on the year that you did? Well, that, you know, looking for sort of Robinson at his peak, just a stride. And I think that that's something that he, for people sometimes forget just how great a ball player he was for a few years. There. In 1949, even by today's metrics, he was the best baseball player alive, better than Musil, better than DiMaggio. He, he was the guy. Um, and he, uh, so to, it was also the year, the first year that he became the aggressive Jackie Robinson that he would be throughout mo throughout his late career, mid and late career. So he'd sort of, you know, he famously and is illustrated in the movie 42, uh, sort of turned the other cheek coming right. to the rookie. And then, and, and the following year, when he played well, rookie of the year and then another solid season, but in 49, he decides the gloves are coming off. He says, they better be rough on me because I'm going to be rough on them. And we see a new Jackie, uh, much freer style of play, more similar to how he had played with Kansas City. Um, and he just simply dominated. I mean, and I think, again, I think that gets a little overlooked. He was, um, that year, he hit better than 340, stole better than 35 bases, had more than 65 extra base hits. Nobody's done that to this day since then, right? And that's 75 years ago. So it gives you a sense of just what a powerful player he was. And he followed that up um, with a, a few more sort of, elite Hall of Fame season. The last thing I'd say about that year, that was also the, the year when he was, had to go down to Washington, D.C., and he testified against Paul Robeson, mm -hmm. uh, House on American Activities Committee. And it's the first time that year where we begin to see Robinson. He was thrust into the political spotlight and the social spotlight simply by nature of what he was doing. But even at the beginning of 1949, he didn't want to have a newspaper column. He was offered it. He just didn't want to get involved. That was the first year we begin to see him step outside, step off the field figuratively, literally, um, and begin to, to take on some things outside the game. Uh, two points you mentioned there, I think, are, were really interesting to me. One, yes, just what a great player he was, you know, and I do, it's amazing that such a well-known, you know, arguably one of the best known athletes in American history, we don't really appreciate what a great baseball player he was because of the the history that he made. And two, uh, I wanted to ask you about sort of what might be considered the sanitization, I guess, of, of Jackie Robinson and the way that he celebrated or, you know, the stories told about his meeting with Branch Rickey and turning the other cheek, you know, but he was an aggressive player. He did become outspoken uh, on civil rights. Um, do you do you agree that his, his, his legacy is uh, not really um, addressed completely in terms of the type of personality and activism that he had? Yes, a hundred percent. And I think, I mean, I, the two separate but heavily related uh, things you're you're asking about and pointing uh, pointing out, Andrew. Um, I think you know th those first couple of years when he intentionally wanted to turn the other cheek. That's all honest and true, and we see that in the movie Forty Two, and that's accurate and that's a fair thing to say. But that changed so dramatically, um, and and it, it, there's nothing. There's nothing bad about that, right? He, he, they would call him the black tie cop. He played aggressively, black, white, any color. You didn't want to be playing against Jackie Robinson. He came in with his spikes high. He yelled at you. He yelled at the umpire if he didn't like it. He was, he was a, a tough guy to play against and a great guy to have on your team. And he was the guy who did the battles for the, for the Dodgers, um, meaning, you know, famously he'd bunt, bunt down the first baseline and try to run into Magley because Magley was hitting everybody. Um, mm -hmm. It was Robinson who's going to take that on for the team. There was no question about it, right? He would Reese with the cap. He would Reese with the captain of the team, and, and very integral to making the whole thing run. But it was Robinson's team, in, in many sense, in many sense for for the way 
interact with other people. Um, and he became increasingly activist. Yes, I think that people, and part of it is that it, 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 what's interesting about it to me is that you couldn't pin him down. Um, what, what, I'll just mm -hmm. jump back or ahead to the book, it, I called it True, The Four Seasons of Jack Robinson. There's a little epigraph at the beginning of the book where I say that, I'm paraphrasing myself here, so apologies if I get it wrong, but you know, he was true, whatever the circumstance or the situation, he was true to himself. He was true to the mission, true to the effort, true to his convictions, and also true to his contradiction. Mm -hmm. so he came out and was activist, not necessarily in a predictable way. Right. Um, he, he, he believed firmly in what he believed in, but he, he had a feud with Martin Luther King, who he worked very closely with, um, with Adam Clayton Powell, with Malcolm X, with you know, basically anybody, if, if Jackie didn't agree, he had a good relationship with, with President Eisenhower, but when Eisenhower gave a speech saying, basically telling Black America, just be patient, we're getting there, he was right on the horn writing a letter, we're not gonna be patient. You've been telling us this for too long, you know? Um, and so, and he famously, he became a Republican. He, we, we think in today's lens, he's more aligned with the Democratic Party. He voted for Nixon over, uh, Kennedy in 1960. He, he, he couldn't stand the Dixiecrats' power, the influence of, of Wallace and Bull Connor and all those um, in the South in that time. Uh, and, but then he wasn't really a Republican because when Barry Goldwater came in, he wasn't standing for what Barry Goldwater had to say, um, that discrimination. So he was a complicated figure. And I think it's a difficult thing sometimes for people to get into. Um, and so it does get sanitized, it just sort of brushed over or shortened um, in, in a way that uh, it can become very interesting. He's a human being, right, with, with, right. with uh, opinion. Yeah, absolutely. And that shines through in the book. Um, okay, so moving on to the uh, fall of his career, not the, the, the autumn, <laughs> I guess that's the better way to put it, right? Um, <laughs> it's hard to believe that Jackie Robinson is is traded <laughs> by the Dodgers, but uh, tell us about sort of the, the final year uh, of his career. So, so I chose for 1956, which is the last year of his career, as you say, um, and it was it was a kind of a, a moving year for me to get, get involved with in some ways, because in 55, which was, of course, a famous year for Dodger fans, the one year they beat the Yankees in the, in the World Series, Jackie really had a rough year. He, he wasn't playing that well. He wasn't even on the field for Game 7 of the World Series when the Yankees, when the Dodgers beat the Yankees. And in 56, he sort of came back. Um, and he would, he would be diagnosed with, with diabetes shortly after that season. He had put on a lot of weight. He was having issues with his legs. He was, he was, you know, a diminished physical person. Um, but he, he had a really valiant season, uh, not like a peak season, but a very productive season, including some big moments in the pennant race, a huge hit to win game six of the World Series and keep the Dodgers alive in 56, the day after Don Larson's perfect game, um, and, and became this very productive player. So it was really interesting to me from a baseball standpoint standpoint, his I'm not going to go gently um, approach. And it was also a place where we, where you really now began to see him making the transition, uh, looking at a career outside of baseball, right? Really now working with, um, he's been doing some things with MLK for, for a couple of years at that point. He began doing some stuff for the NAACP. Um, so it's, it's really interesting um, sort of season or crossing point for, for Robinson in his life. Absolutely. And then the uh, the winter of his life, um, you know, I wrote a book about Perry Wallace, who was the first black basketball player in the SEC. Wow. He died young. Um, seems like a lot of pioneers uh, die young, you know, and um, it was painful to read about uh, the last months and year uh, of, of Jackie Robinson, a lot of, um, you know, his own illness, but a lot of deaths surrounding him. Um, what, what was what were you trying to accomplish, you know, uh, in that last chapter? Yeah, well, I mean, so it is, of course, it's the last year of his life, and he died in October of that year. It was also a very active year for him. You know, he famously spoke at the World Series just nine days before he died, and, and classic sort of speech half, very polite and very grateful, and then the last singer at the end, but we need to have uh, a Black manager. Uh, he, he So it was also the year when... When Robinson left baseball after the 56 season, he was basically not in the baseball season, uh, stadium again until 1972. 
when he sort of repatriated into the game, even before that World Series, he does an event with the Dodgers. That all began at Gil Hodges' funeral uh, in April when, when Robinson went uh, and was reunited with a lot of ballplayers he hadn't seen in a long time. Um, and so it was just sort of fitting, sort of coming home again year of him getting reinvolved in baseball, uh, reengaging himself with the sport, and doing all other, you know, other types of, of things that he did. You know, he had a construction company, he had a bank, he had lots of different things. So it, it was it was a fitting, you know, he wasn't idle to the end, um, and I wanted to see him back in his milieu, which means around baseball. Um, so to me, it was, it was a year that just it packed a lot in and, and, and showed you a lot about his Dakota of his life. Mm -hmm. uh, you hinted at this at the outset, but you know, the title true in some ways implies maybe that there are some things uh, about Jackie that are untrue that are, that are lingering out there. And I was wondering um, wh where did you see those <laughs> untruths uh, and what was important to you to really sort of set the record straight on? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I, I didn't, uh, and it's a, it's a very good um, sort of assessment. I, I didn't mean it that way, or I didn't mean to imply that there was great myth or untruth about him. Um, I, I really meant it more, as I was saying before, about a description of him, his sort of trueness, so to speak, in, mm -hmm. in, in his approach to life. Um, I do think, just, just mainly the things that we talked about earlier, that there, there, was, there are complexities and nuances um, you know, people either think of him as a guy who turned the other cheek or they think of him as a rough ball player. They think of him as this type of political figure or that type when really it, 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 he was much more complicated. He was uh, as, as we all are. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. So I felt that um, that not, it's not quite misrepresentation, but sort of things just a little lost in the sauce has happened sometimes with, with anybody. Um, yeah. there's, a, there's a narrative about somebody and people seize on that narrative, which might not be wrong, but it's just incomplete. I think what I liked the best about the book was it brought a mythical figure down to such a human level, you know, um, and like a well, literally like a street level, you know, you write about the neighborhoods that he walked through the, you know, there'd be pumpkins for sale in the, in the fall, you know, or what it smelled like and what uh, people were listening to on the radio. You felt like, you know, you were, there that he was a real human being to the people in his neighborhoods, the people that were watching him play, the people that were influenced by him. And, you know, I, I think that's the, the great genius of writing about a mythical figure when you make them even bigger by writing about their humanity, you know, and I th feel like that was what was accomplished in this book. Well, thank you for saying it. I, I, I was fortunate and lucky to, to speak with a lot of people who grew up um, in, I think in the years you're talking about in Brooklyn, mm -hmm. um, I also spoke to people who remembered him from, from Montreal. Um, and, and, and they brought it, they helped me bring it to life. They really did because, because he meant that much. He was that kind of a figure that you, you, people would talk about and know about. And, and um, he came to work every day in, in Brooklyn uh, where, where I lived, you know, whoever I is, where you or I, you know, the, the person lived. Uh, and, and one of the nice things, Andrew, about and maybe you've experienced this with in, in, in other ways, but with the books you've done, is sort of the people who've come out after the book has come and written to me or reached out. And, uh, you know, I remember that book when I was on that block. I remember, you know, thank you for writing. You know, and, and, and it's really a great, a great thing. It sort of gives you confidence as a writer that, OK, you represented it well. And also it's uh, it's, you know, it's just nice to be able to reach people on the street where they were where they lived kind of in a sense absolutely um well Kasia, it's been about a half an hour here so uh wrap things up and thank you that's a, a wonderful book i recommend any baseball fan uh read it um is there anything else you wanted to say about jackie uh i, I was i was going to ask you about the response to the book i guess it came out here at the beginning of the baseball season um you've been hearing from people i assume that that grew up in those neighborhoods that knew him. It's pretty incredible that 50 years after uh, his death, essentially, that he is still such uh, uh, accomplishing change. You know, there's people who are still, uh, have been had their lives changed by him that are still active today, and he's still uh, achieving progress, really, uh, well after his death. Yeah, and, I, and, and that's, there's no question that's true, and, and the Jackie Robinson Foundation continues to do it, it's wonderful work that that, but so many other ways in which he, he touches people. And we always, we hear stories on Jackie Robinson Day every year 
uh, about how he's affected today's ball players or these ball players' parents. Uh, you know, I think one thing that's important is a- any number of since the beginning of baseball, obviously, <laughs> any number of, of black players could have thrived and played very well in in the major leagues, right? So it was just a matter of time of the opportunity. But to be the first did take a special, in addition to talent, took a special uh, resilience. uh, 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 They they embraced it. I mean, mean, Jack Mm -hmm. and Rachel, they embraced the charge that was put on them and they honored it and they respected the enormity of the weight. That's not to say things weren't incredibly difficult for Larry Doby and for Monty Irvin and Willie May and on and on. But the specialness of being the first and why his name is still spoken about, they understood it, they embraced it, and he was the right human being for that task um, and that incredible pressure. And, and that's, I think that's a big reason why we are still hearing about him and talking about him today. If he'd come along and had a one or two year okay career, I think it just simply would have been different. He was a huge presence. As I said, for times he was the best player or and among the top three or four players in the game. Um, and, and after his career continued to embrace it. And I think that's why a big part of why we're still hearing him and his message is still resonant um, 50 years after his death, 75 years after he broke in. Absolutely. Well, uh, thanks again. Again, the book is uh, True, The Four Seasons of Jackie Robinson. I encourage everybody to uh, buy it and recommend it to their friends. Uh, Kasia, thank you so much uh, for joining us on the Pandemic Baseball Book Club. It was my pleasure. And thank you for the wonderful interview, Andrew. I, I appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Take care. Bye-bye.